Our beautiful lake has a rich history. Over the years, it's been known as Llanos Pond, Cooper's Pond, Great Nine Mile Pond, Nine Mile Pond, Great Pond, and finally, Wequaket Lake. But Wequaket's story is not often told. Information is often difficult to find, and few people remain who can pass down stories of the old days. So please join me for a brief history of Wequaget Lake. About 18,000 years ago, the Wisconsin Glacier had retreated away from Cape Cod and into the Gulf of Maine. The great ice blocks that remained buried in the masses of clay, sand, and gravel gradually melted, forming kettle holes that resulted in the many ponds and lakes found throughout the Cape, including our Requaquet Lake. The varied features of Barnstable were beginning to be formed. By the time indigenous people started living in the area, about 5,000 years ago, the basic appearance of Barnstable was about the same as it is today. One of the most beautiful of the seven villages in the town of Barnstable is Centerville. Its roots go back to the 1600s when it was called Chiquaquet, meaning Pleasant Harbor or Village by the Sea. It was named by the local Wampanoag Indians. Native Americans had lived, fished, and hunted around the lake for hundreds of years. Many Native American words are used to this day as names of locations, streets, and other points of interest. The area of land that Chiquaquet occupied was part of a much larger tract purchased in 1648 from the Wampanoag Sachem Popmamuk by Miles Standish for two brass kettles and some fencing. The village continued to be known as Chiquaquet until the post office was established in 1834, at which time, because of its geographical position, was renamed Centerville. The earliest houses in Chiquaquet were built in the northern end of the village near Cooper's Pond, which is what Wequaquet Lake was named at that time. This area offered fresh drinking water for people and livestock, fertile land for farming, and a bountiful supply of fish. One of the oldest houses still standing in the village is located just off of Finney's Lane on Farm Hill Road. It was built in 1717 by Uncle John Gallison, a well-known navigator who taught many Centerville boys the art of navigation. As early as the 1700s, seafaring had become a way of life for local men as an alternative to farming. In fact, records show that no less than 15 Centerville captains or masters of vessels were actively engaged in a life at sea before 1800. In 1700, the town of Barnstable was divided into two precincts for the purpose of training of men-in-arms. This dividing line crossed Sandy Neck, ran west of Calves Pasture Point and Coggins Pond, and straight to the shore of Cooper's Pond, which was the name of Wequaquet Lake in 1700. The line continued from our lake in a gentle curve southward to what is now Scudder Bay. This same 1700 dividing line was used again in 1715, when Barnstable was divided into two parishes, East and West. The East Parish started construction of their new church and meeting house in 1715, on the site of the current Unitarian Universalist Church building on Cobbs Hill, in what is now Barnstable Village. The West Parish started the construction of their new church and meeting house in 1717, that building still stands proudly in West Barnstable and is well known as the 1717 Meeting House. In the early 19th century, Chiquaquet experienced dramatic expansion and growth. Most people lived in one-story, shingled Cape Cod-style cottages scattered along Finney's Lane in the vicinity of Wequaquet Lake, then called Great Nine Mile Pond. In 1796, a church had been built to accommodate the growing population. It was situated on the north side of the intersection of Finney's Lane and Strawberry Hill Road on land acquired from the aforementioned Uncle John Gallison. This church was associated with the East Parish Church. 
The minister came from there to Centerville to preach on the fourth Sunday of each month. On the remaining Sundays, the villagers had to go to Barnstable Village to church by horse or on foot. The villagers traveled north on Finney's Lane to the East Parish Church. They would wear their rugged, everyday shoes up to Grandma's Rock, pause, change into their more formal shoes, leave their everyday shoes on Grandma's Rock, then walk the remaining of the way to church. Upon returning, they would reverse that process at the rock and continue the remainder of their long walk home in their more rugged shoes. At some point in the mid-1800s, a herring ditch was dug between Long Pond and the sea by workmen using wooden shovels with iron rims. In 1867, this ditch was improved by unemployed veterans of the Civil War and paid for by the town of Barnstable. It now connected Wequocket Lake, then known as Nine Mile Pond, to Long Pond and to the sea, establishing the Centerville Herring Run as a fishery. So herring fishing, and no doubt shellfish gathering, was practiced by these earlier villagers. So what brought people to Centerville and our lake in the late 1800s? Following the Industrial Revolution in Massachusetts and the growth of cities, more people had access to relative wealth and increased free time. The newly built railroad brought people from Boston to Cape Cod, where many came for sailing, boating, fishing, or riding. The recreational and resort possibilities of Nine Mile Pond Lake Wequocket, began to be appreciated and developed. It had long been a favorite haunt of duck hunters in the fall, at a time when ducks crossed from Sandy Neck over Shoot Flying Hill to the pond where whole flocks settled in the fresh water. Perhaps no one played a greater part in making our lake a popular place for sport and recreation than Howard Marston. He realized that Nine Mile Pond was a colorless name and that this beautiful body of water was quite large enough to be called a lake. He and his father owned extensive property here. In 1891 they sponsored a regatta and for that promotion the pond was officially renamed Wequocket Lake from the Native American word Wequocket meaning fair, pleasant and delightful. Writing in 1895 Russell Scudder Nye a distant relative of resident Louise Howland, tells of duck hunting on the lake. He was a guest at the camp of Mr. Howard Marston at Stony Point. Stony Point juts out into the center of the lake at the end of Nye's Neck, which extends from the North Shore. The camp he writes of was owned by Howard Marston and his son Shirley. Mr. Nye wrote, Having got the decoys out and placed to our satisfaction, we were at liberty to turn our attention to the lovely landscape spread out before us. The view of the lake from Stony Point being grand and beautiful, commanding as it does a fine lookout in every direction. The lake is at its widest here, and with the aid of the glass, we can plainly discern all that is transpiring at Bliss's Point on the opposite shore. And away to the northwest, we can look into the blind at Annabelle Point directly opposite. Shoot Flying Hill, the most prominent landmark for miles around, looks benignly down upon the beautiful panorama nature here spreads out for her lovers. In 1896, Marston had the lake surveyed by George W. Eldridge, a distant relative of resident Steve Howland, who was a hydrographer from Chatham. The survey stated that the lake covered 656 acres and the shoreline measured 10 and a half miles. From the survey, a map was made that was useful for charting the courses of sailing races, complete with buoys and soundings. Of this period, Evelyn Crosby, a noted historian, wrote, Mr. Marston had two boathouses on the south side of the lake. One was to house his boats, and the other was to look out, where people were invited to be his guests and watch boat races. It was an event to go to Wequocket Lake for the boat races on Saturdays and Sundays. Often the Crosby boys from Osterville raced their Crosby catboats on the lake. Another entrepreneur, 
Elisha B. Bierce, had been catering to vacationers on the lake since 1875. His waterfront camp and home nearby offered living accommodations and dining, especially for hunters and fishermen. Grover Cleveland was a guest there, as well as Joseph Jefferson, the celebrated actor acclaimed for his portrayal of Rip Van Winkle. Other notable guests included Governor Herrick of Ohio and a governor of Indiana. They no doubt came as much for Bierce's famous dinners as for the fishing and hunting. By 1900, camps for boys and girls popped up like mushrooms in picturesque locations on the shores of ponds or by the sea. A booklet of this period called The Truth About Cape Cod contained the following enticement. Cape Cod is an ideal region for boys and girls, and the number of camps where they may spend the summer under favorable conditions is constantly increasing. These camps are all easily accessible and parents readily find accommodations for themselves nearby. There were two such camps on Lake Wequaket, one for boys, another for girls. Camp Wequaket, in its brochure of 1925, stated that the camp was open to boys of good character and training between the ages of 8 and 15 years. It was located on the northwest shore of the lake on Point Shirley, named for Howard Marston's son, Shirley. It was originally the abandoned farm of Lemuel Jones, which Howard Marston had purchased. In 1925, however, the camp was the property of Frank L. Gibson of Boston. The other camp, called Maricopa, was a camp for girls, which was located on Bierce's Pond, a northeast segment of Weequaket Lake. On the west side of the lake, at the location of the present yacht club was Camp Opechee, a Native American word for robin taken from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. Camp Opechee was not a camp for children, but a restaurant and inn originally operated by Mr. and Mrs. Albert Stark. Most of the earliest cottages on the lake in the early 1900s were located near Camp Opechee. 1904 marked the first year of Centerville's Old Home Week, and Wequaket Lake was a big part of those celebrations. Saturday marked a full day of athletic activities centered around and on our lake. In 1906, the Centerville Club of Boston was founded, and Camp Opechee was a favorite meeting place for the club. It kept people living in Boston, who had family connections with Centerville, in touch with each other and with the village where many of them spent their summers. In 1927, a large area off Finney's Lane was offered for development by H. Angus Connors. This area embraced most of the southeast corner of the lake. It became known as Wequaket Heights, the name that area maintains to this day. Connors took out a full-page ad on September 1, 1927, in the Barnstable Patriot, stating, among other details, that lots will be a minimum of 100 by 100 feet, with prices ranging from $150 to $500. The property is restricted to keep out the undesirables. Entrance is through the White Gates on Finney's Lane. The White Gates are long gone, but it's reasonable to assume that they would have been at the Center Street entrance. In any event, the area was rapidly built up with summer homes, many of which have since been converted to year-round residences. But let's not overlook our own neighborhood, Wequaket Estates. Our beautiful neighborhood was created on land that was, at one time, the Lewis Farm. The farmhouse was built sometime between 1780 and 1820. The exact year and original owner cannot be determined due to a fire in the courthouse in the mid-1800s that destroyed many town records. The 1858 map of Centerville shows that an L. Lewis lived here. The county deeds show an Ezra Lewis owned the property in 1861. In 1877, Ezra sold the property to Ambrose Lewis. In 1912, Ambrose Lewis started selling off sections of his land. 
Melancy C. White appears on various deeds from 1912 to July of 1934, when she purchased the remaining land, including the farmhouse, from Ambrose Lewis. Of interesting note, according to the 1910 census, Melancy White was the granddaughter of Ambrose Lewis and was recorded as living with him. In other censuses, her name was recorded as Melencia and two different spellings of Melanie. She may very well have been the person our Melody's Pond is named after. In any event, her birth and death records clearly state her legal name was Melancy. Melancy died in Centerville in 1953. In November of 1954, Nathan Bresner of Brookline bought lots A through D and all remaining real estate owned by Melancy White around Wequocket Lake from her estate. Subdivision and construction of the first houses around the lake began in 1955. This area eventually became Wequocket Estates. In conclusion, the pamphlet entitled Old Home Week Celebration for Centerville 1904 says it best. The old days are long since past, and the hunting grounds of the Indian have been converted into the peaceful homes that we see about us today. All who have had the good fortune to be born in this neighborhood ought to be proud of their birthplace, as Cape people are usually high esteemed wherever known. The same elements of nobility and kindly affection which were transplanted here in the wilderness many years ago have been transmitted through generations that have followed, and we trust will ever be the heritage of those that are yet unborn. Thank you for watching this Brief History of Wequocket Lake presentation. Future history and memories of programs will be available on our Weba website and on our Weba YouTube channel.